Thank you, Alicia, I appreciate it, yeah. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Fernando Flores, and uh, it's, it's uh, awesome to be able to be here and just share a little bit you know, about my background with you and what I'm doing now and how is it that I got here. I, I, I tend to get you know, those, those questions a lot, and so I wanna make sure that um, I really tailor it to the real life experiences that I've lived but also tie it in to what you're learning and also tie it into you know, a little bit about you know, who you are and what you're gonna be you know, going through as you keep moving th you know, through the educational system. So um, before I tell you a lot more about myself, I wanna learn about you, okay? And I think we have enough time to be able to do that. We're just getting started. Everybody just went around and told us a little bit about their aspirations, their background, their goals, why they're interested in doing what they're doing. And what I want to do now is share a little bit about myself with you, right? You were able to share um, your background with me. I want to share my background, my passions, my interests with you. And to start off, I was born in Evanston, Illinois, right next to Chicago. Okay, that's, that's where I was born. And I lived there till I was about 10 months old, a little baby, right? And I went to live in Mexico when I was 10 months. Uh, with my mother and my grandmother. I grew up over there, Spanish was my first language, right? And uh, that's a picture of me. I can still, you know, a little bit strike that, you know, pose a little bit. Yeah, bring it down a little bit, you know? So this is, uh, you know, where I started uh, learning about, you know, cultures. We were talking about cultures. This is where I started learning about, um, you know, my particular culture. And growing up in Mexico was really intense. You know, like the classes over there, um, they just run a very strict, regimented, uh, uh, you know, course, even as a young kid, right? And I ended up getting into, into uh, math very ex extensively. And when I came over here, I had like this fourth grade level math when I was in second grade. And so I, I got into, into, uh, into, into math a lot. I didn't know if that was, you know, what I was going to be doing later on in life. But um, when I was about eight years old, that's when my father stayed here in the United States working and providing, you know, support to us from far away. And we reunited with him. And I remember the period of the reunification period when my mother actually crossed the border. And there was a period when we separated for about five, six days. She was, uh, you know, she had been caught. She was you know, sent to, to uh, Border Patrol prison. And it was a really challenging period as an eight-year-old. You know, we, had, we were waiting for her like at a Burger King by the San Isidro border. And I had not in any way, shape, or form, you know, I didn't think, I didn't know what was going on as an eight-year-old, right? But when we ended up going to uh, the LA area, that's where I ended up uh, reuniting with my, with my, my dad, right? And, I saw my mom like five, six days later, I was like so happy, you know? Like when you haven't seen your, your you know, a loved family, a loving family member, and I just like gave her a big hug. And I thought, okay, cool, you know, my family's reunited, you know, we're here in the United States, uh, let's go for it, everything's gonna be fine, right? But what ended up happening was that, little did I know that there was going to be a lot of fear in my life from that point on. You with me so far? 
a lot of fear, right? This was back in the early 90s. And uh, back then, similar to now, there was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiments. They tried to take benefits away from children, right, um, back then. And it was a really challenging period, the way that immigrants were depicted then, which is really reminiscent of how they're being depicted today. And in many ways, today is, is you know, even more magnified. But history does repeat itself, and I do remember those times, and it was really scary for my mom even to go to the grocery store to buy bread and milk for her two kids because she thought that she was gonna be just caught and sent back and we were gonna be separated again. And that was really challenging because I ended up seeing all of that. I also saw the discrimination, the harassment, the very difficult situations of not getting paid for your work as well that my family experienced that I knew was wrong, but I didn't know what to do about it. I had absolutely no idea. What, you know, what do I do? Um, but I internalized all of that, and I knew that I was going to do something about it. So how was it that I decided to become an attorney? Well, when I was uh, 12 years old, okay, here in the United States for years, I had learned English a little bit better. And at 12, I ended up getting hit by a car. A lady was in the parking lot, and instead of driving forward, she unfortunately had been drunk driving, and she put reverse. And she hit about seven other people and myself, but I was one of the few that took it the worst. The car ended up breaking my femur in half. And so my femur, what happened is it broke, and then it just dropped to the side, okay? And this is at 12 years old. And what happened was that the, when I was in the emergency room, um, there was a lot of fear that happened in that period in my family, as you can imagine. Fear of what my health was going to be like. Was I gonna be able to walk again? Fear of who's gonna pay for all these bills, right? You can imagine like low income immigrant family, something like this happens, it's unexpected, it's not planned for, right? Who's gonna take care of all this stuff? thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, so there was a lot of fear that came up again, a lot of concern, a lot of worry. And the doctors decided to put a screw through my knee so that slowly my femur would realign. And I, had, I was in bed for 27 days, okay, with my screw through my knee and a pulley, just 26 days, 27 days, bringing my femur realigned slowly, okay? 26 days, that was the easy part. <laughs> the next part was for seven weeks, I was in a cast from here all the way down to my leg, right? And I was laying down. So suffice to say, it was really difficult because I couldn't even stand up to go to the restroom. So you figure out how I did that. Um, but that's me. Um, the picture to the right, is me with my cast from my stomach all the way down to my leg, right? And the picture to your left is, I spent my birthday there in the summer actually, when I was 12 years old. And um, again, there was a lot of fear that came up. There was a lot of concern, a lot of worry, a lot of uncertainty. And when you are living from a place of uncertainty, uh, it can be challenging if you don't know how to manage it, right? And as a kid, it was, really, it was really difficult because I really didn't know how to manage it. But in this period of fear, in this period of worry, you know, and I, and I, and I love seeing you just kind of like, oh my God, this is so much, you know? <laughs> it's like, what's going on in your life? But this is, this is what I went through, all right? And in this period of uncertainty, we ended up getting a representation by an attorney, right? When, when me and my family were dealing with this very difficult period in our lives, we ended up having the support of an attorney uh, who represented us back in the day in a lawsuit that helped pay for the medical costs, that pay, helped pay for uh, different bills that ended up coming up. And I really, really liked what he did for me and my family, okay? And honestly, I, I saw what he did for us, and in that moment, in those months that he was providing representation to us, I decided that that's what I wanted to do for others. I wanted to help others in one of their most difficult periods in their lives. When they're down, I'm gonna make sure that I do whatever's in my power to be there for them, 
With me so far? Give me a thumbs up if you're with me. Okay? And I wanted to do whatever I had to in order to make it happen. So I ended up after, you know, that was at 12. So I ended up focusing, keeping, you know, my head in the game. Uh, I was able to talk to counselors that supported me, right? And, and mind you, I didn't know any English till I was like 12, 13 years old. That's when I really started learning English a lot better, right? It took a few years. Um, and I ended up getting into UC Berkeley. I graduated from UC Berkeley with a rhetoric and sociology major. And I'm going to leave a few minutes at the end. If you have any questions, feel free to write them down and you know, I'll answer them for you. I'm an open book. And then I went to law school for three years at UC Davis, Martin Luther King Jr. Hall. Okay? And I graduated from UC Davis. I took the bar exam. I failed it. The bar exam is a three-day, eight-hour-a-day exam. It's 24 hours of testing. Imagine just how much that is. And you study for seven days a week for months in advance of that. Okay, it's, it's challenging, it's very difficult. Now it's two days, but, but back when I took it, it was three full days, and I had to take it twice. So it's six full days of examination in order for me to be able to get my license and become an attorney, okay? And uh, Judge Tagazugi, he, he actually passed away um, already, but he was the first Japanese American judge to ever be appointed to the federal courts, and I was really, really uh, excited about having him be the one that swore me in. And I took an oath to uphold the Constitution of California, the Constitution of the United States as an attorney, right, and not disavow anyone who has the need of an attorney, right? And so remember that, because that comes into play later. And I ended up, uh, doing all of that, and what I want to tell you a little bit, you know, I'm a first generation, and I had to rely on certain powers, but it took years for me to figure out what those powers were, but I want to tell you, you have those powers too, right? It doesn't matter what background, it doesn't matter what age, it doesn't matter, you know, what socioeconomic background and, you know, what beliefs you have, you have these powers, and they're, you know, my GPA, but it's not the kind of GPA you're thinking about, right? It's Grit, positivity, and appreciation. Grit, positivity, and appreciation. I know by the mere fact that you're sitting here listening to this conversation that you have a ton of grit. You're grinding, you're fighting every single day, every single week, every single month. You're here, you're doing it, you're showing up. You have a ton of grit, and it's really important that you don't forget that. Because you're not, going, you're not going on a journey based on everything that you told me that you're interested in doing. You're not going on a journey that's gonna get easier as you go. It's gonna get more challenging. The waves are not gonna get smaller. They're gonna get bigger. But you can learn how to surf, all right? And this right here, relying on grit, is an incredibly important tool that you already have that you can intentionally use in certain periods when you face challenges, okay? Another really important tool that I've had to rely on and that I know you also have is, and that you can develop if you feel you don't have it to the level that you want to have it, is positivity. Positivity genuinely is a choice. People might say, no, that's not a choice, you know, positivity, like, no. As an attorney, I've learned that to every set of facts, there's two truths. We are seeing that today with Ford and Kavanaugh. Are we not? To every set of facts, there's two truths, right? In my view, there's only one when it comes to that situation. But <laughs> those are lawyers, those are lawyers, and they're, they're creating two different versions of a story. Similarly, with your mindset, when something comes up, right, you have the choice of choosing to see it in a positive light or in a negative light, okay? And that's a real choice that you have. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how difficult the situation may be, you, you have a choice, okay? And then the last one is really appreciation or gratitude. One of the things that I started 
doing as a professional, it's like, look, I, I would just you know, keep going. I would just work and I would just make things happen and I, I would just keep doing uh, different, uh, I, I would, I would uh, achieve certain goals that I had for myself, right? That I had set for myself. But one of the things that I started realizing was that there were certain things in my life that I did not appreciate. For me, that didn't happen until three years ago. And this is one of the reasons why I love you know, coming out and talking to different students and helping you realize just how many things you have to be grateful for in your life. Three years ago, unfortunately, I had a very close friend of mine pass away. And that was the impetus for me to decide to start taking care of my health a lot better. He was 47 years old. He left my two-year-old godson behind. And it just happened from one day to the next. I was hoping to see him, you know, uh, you know, in an upcoming weekend. You know, we were supposed to meet up on a Saturday. I flew back on Friday, and as I was coming back, that's when I found out he had heart, a sudden heart attack. He had died from a heart attack. And him being so young, you know, he used to play in the Barcelona basketball team professionally, you know, being healthy. I was like, man, if it can happen to him, like, I need to take care of myself. Because I would do trials, you know, I'd go, good morning, Your Honor, may it please the court. My name is Fernando Flores. And today, my client is here to vindicate her rights. She worked 14 hours a day and was not paid a single penny of overtime. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I would do in court. And um, I, really, I really enjoyed it, but it took so much effort, so much time, so much energy, so much uh, uh, dedication and commitment to doing that, that well, what would I do? I would put myself last, and I would put my health last, right? And so I'd go through this experience of trials without paying any attention to my well-being, to my wellness. And when I left private practice and then I went to government, what I made a decision, and, you know, and, and I lost my friend, I made a decision to switch the equation and put myself first, to put my health first. Let's see what happens. Let's give it a shot. It doesn't matter what, what trial I have coming up, what appellate argument I have coming up, it doesn't matter, right? I'm gonna make sure that I exercise that I exercise at least four times a week, right? And so I started with one small step, and it was that. Months later, I was like, okay, let me see what else I can do. I started journaling. I wanted to make sure that I reflect on what was going on in my life so that years later, I could see the growth, right? And then, that's when I, st I started doing my morning uh, gratitude meditation. And basically what I do is I made sure every morning to think of three things. This is how I started. Three things that I'm grateful for in my life. So just take a second and think of one. One thing or one person you're grateful for in your life. Got it? It takes a few seconds, right? And so I take a minute and I, at first I was like, okay, what am I grateful for? Okay, I, I committed to doing this exercise every day, every morning, here we go. You know, and I go, okay, I'm thankful for this. Uh, I'm also thankful for that, and then I'm thankful for that. In the beginning it was like, it was actually a little bit challenging for me because I'd never done it before, right? I've never been intentionally grateful for what I have in my life. Even though I'd you know, gone to Berkeley, gone to Davis Law School, been an attorney for seven, eight years, I've never done that. And in moving that forward, I, I realized as months went on how many things I really have to be grateful for. And now I get up every morning and my gratefulness meditation, doesn't matter where I am in the world, I take that with me. I, am great, I, I like, have created a system for it where what am I grateful for that happened in my life yesterday? What am I grateful for that's going to happen or is happening in my life right now? And what am I grateful for that's going to happen in my life tomorrow? And I'll literally spew off 10 to 15 things for each every single morning. Everything from the oxygen that flows through my lungs, the blood that flows through my heart, my bed, my pillow, <laughs> you know, my supporting wife, my family, 
I mean, I could just go on and on because I was able to develop that mindset of gratefulness. And there's real power. I mean, can you imagine if you go all in on gratefulness? And I, I'll be honest with you, I wanted to put gratefulness and appreciation first, but like the acronym wouldn't have worked. <laughs> so I put it last, but it's really one of my main powers, okay? So just FYI. So um, I wanna do a very quick exercise and just, just really quickly, like five seconds. Um, I'll, I'll pick a few of you and just tell me a little bit about what your morning routine looks like, because this is really important. Humberto, just tell me. You get up, okay? You're in bed, you get up, what do you do? Go to the bathroom, brush your teeth, and then? Wash your face. Drink some water. Put on clothes, and then you're out the door. Okay, cool. Um, yes, hi, how are you? Yeah, tell me, morning routine, really quickly. Cool. And I started in doing, well, every, I think I do it almost every weekend now. Okay. Like I want to do it um, uh, daily. Yeah. But I started working on meditation in the morning. Awesome. And I'm working with crystals as well. Beautiful. And I think it sets your mind right for the morning, for the day okay. in general. I think I started uh, being more relaxed. Cool. More at peace. Weekdays, in the days that you don't do that particular meditation or work with crystals. I feel morning. like I need it. Like okay. the days that I don't do it. Like and, and then you just get out the door and yeah. start your day. Okay, cool. All right. Tell me a little bit about your morning routine, really quickly. Uh, I wake up, I take a shower, I brush my teeth. I usually put in my contacts, but you know, today it was not one of those no. days. No, today not. I feel you. I feel you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Cool, awesome. Anybody get up and then check their phone? Cool, thank you for being honest, awesome. And what are some of the things that you check? Was it news, or social media, both? The time. Just what time it is? The time news. Is. Time and weather, can I go back to, is it cold outside? Can I go back to sleep? Yeah. You know? <laughs> that's, that's basically me in the morning, like, cause I get up really early, no matter what. Like, yeah. I always get up at like six or like um, five. Yeah. And then I, I look at the time, I'm like, oh, I gotta go to school and then go back to sleep. And not until like 30 minutes later, I gotta get up and go to school. So I'm like, okay, just fresh real fast. And I gotta like go downstairs, go get something to drink, and get up and then like, go up the house. That's like, that's, that's, that's kind of my day. Let me tell you a little bit about that because I, I share a similar experience where, because what you mentioned was, I get up in the morning and I can't fall back asleep. I used to think that sucked and that was a weakness, but then I saw it, you know, it was a choice, right? Do I see it as a negative or a positive? I saw it as a positive later on in my life because I was like, you know what? A lot of people can't meditate in bed when they first wake up because they'll fall back asleep and then they can't start their day. I don't, I'm very similar. Once I'm up, I'm awake. And so I started to use that as, you know, uh, as a tool, as a positive tool for me. So that when I, the first thing I do when I wake up, I know I'm not going back to sleep. That's when I do my meditation, right? And that's a strength. I saw, I chose to see it as a strength. So there's things about yourself, right? That you do in the morning that you, you, everybody said you groom yourself. You know, you brush your teeth, you clean your teeth, you clean your face, right? You take a shower, you put your clothes on, you, you, you do everything that you need to do in order to groom yourself on the outside. But what are you doing to groom yourself on the inside? Every single morning, what are you doing, right? And that's incredibly important. Yeah, like nothing, you know? <laughs> I love that face, like <laughs> nothing. And so um, it's really important for you to gain awareness of that, right? Because if you don't make a conscious effort as to the conversations that are going on in your head, right, the majority of them are gonna be negative because that's just how our brain works folks in psychology, right? You, you guys are gonna be learning that if you haven't so already. We have about 50 to 70,000 thoughts every single day, okay? A ton of those create what? It's emotions. And emotions is my jam, all right? Because I didn't know the incredible power of emotional intelligence in the law practice. And now as a high performance coach, that's what I'm doing. 
I'm bridging emotional intelligence and the development thereof in the courtroom, in preparing clients for trial, in working with clients, in doing depositions, right? There is a ton of things that we exchange and interact through and interact with. And a lot of people think, oh, money is the strongest currency. No, no, my friends, emotions are. You can have all the money in the world, but if you don't know how to foster genuine joy and excitement, self-love, self-empowerment for yourself, good luck. Good luck with all that money. You with me so far? It's only gonna get better. Um, <laughs> So for me, right, it's become really important to make sure that I don't waste a single day without doing the things that I love, without doing things that bring me genuine joy and excitement. Those two emotions, joy and excitement, are the hardest emotions to foster in your life. Because we are so conditioned to seeing, you know, everybody else, oh my gosh, everybody is super happy on social media all the time, every day, all day, every day. Like, that's not reality. That's not reality. And I know that because I run 30-day emotional, uh, emotional wellness and awareness uh, challenges with other attorneys, right? And we, I mean, we have a blast. We're just letting each other know, hey, today I was pissed, today I was upset, today I feel great, you know? And we go through so many emotions throughout the day and that's how we're really interacting with each other. I mean, if we're upset, at you, if I'm upset at you, I'll be like, mm, I'm not gonna wanna talk to you, right? It's an emotion through which we're interacting or not interacting, right? When you love someone, you interact in a very different way than when you hate someone, right? And so every day I try to work towards how can I help someone in a way that I best know how, right? And what I did when I went from working as an attorney who was emotionless or emotionally constipated, as I like to say, okay, to becoming aware that I needed to develop this dimension of myself, that I had completely disregarded it because growing up, you know, not, not, not to... Uh, uh, make my upbringing look bad or anything, but it was just what it was. You know, I grew up being told, hey, you know, don't cry, you know, or, or don't feel this, don't feel that, you're, 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 be a man, you know? And, and it's like, you grow up that way, and you grow up with a much limited range of emotional awareness. You don't know how to process certain emotions. You don't know how to work through certain emotions but it's so incredibly important. Who's ever dealt with stress? An emotion that you all experience, right? And see, what happens is, if you don't know that your concerns, those 50 to 70,000 thoughts, 90% of them are from yesterday, okay? And about 90, 95% of them tend to be negative. A lot of self-judgment about yourself. So every day, if you don't become intentional about what you're thinking, right, what starts happening is there's just a recurring story that you keep telling yourself about yourself. So is that story gonna be one where, oh my gosh, I have a lot of fear, self-doubt, and insecurity, or is it gonna be one of self-empowerment, belief in yourself, right? And you really have the power to work through that and make a choice as to which one is gonna be the one that you walk on every single day, okay? So after learning a lot of this, this year I decided to go to the Dilly Detention Center. Who's ever heard of the Dilly Detention Center? No, okay. The Dilly Detention Center is the largest detention center for families in the border who are seeking asylum. That's where separated families live. And if you haven't heard of it, you should look into it. You should hear of it. And if you have the opportunity, I recommend that you go volunteer and help out. 
You don't need a license. My wife is a PhD student. She's never been an attorney, but she speaks Spanish, and she was able to go and provide representation to these women. And when I went over there, it relates to learning about other cultures. I went with the mindset of, I want to go help because as an attorney, I can represent clients, especially immigrant, monolingual, Spanish-speaking clients. Right? I have awesome skills as an attorney. I speak the language. Let's go. Let's do this. But, and here's the thing. Was there fear? Was there self-doubt? Yes, because I've never done immigration law before. I've done labor and employment law. Right? I've helped a lot of workers who haven't been paid right recover their wages. But I had never done immigration law before. And before going into the, the, the volunteer program, there's a lot of you know, just concern. But I knew that if I don't manage that concern, that concern turns into worry. And worry, my friends, turns into stress. Stress turns into anxiety. Anxiety leads to feelings of being overwhelmed. And that's when you start getting into issues of depression, right? And it's re therefore really important that if you have a constant concern coming up over and over and over, pay attention to it. Learn to speak to it, not in a negative way. Learn to see it and work through it. Because if not, it's going to take you down that path sooner or later in your life. So when I went to the Dili Detention Center, I generally didn't know what to expect, and I generally didn't know what I had gotten myself into. The picture on the top right, that's you know, the team that I work with in early July. You, know, you can see the Dili sign over there. And down here where the flags are, that's the Texas flag and uh, where the detention center is. The picture down here, the reason I have my hands out like this is because our clients at the detention center are treated like criminals, even though they're escaping crime in their own countries, in Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, Peru, Cuba. I mean, I represented clients from all these countries. And yet, they're treated like criminals themselves, including their months old baby, their one-year-old, their two-year-old. Unfortunately, they don't allow us to you know, touch them in any way as we would with our regular clients. So what we do is we show them the international you know, sign of love. And just, you know, we, we're here, we support you. And, and that's how we would show that as their advocates, we were here for them, right? And what happened when I was over there, uh, I ended up, and we can turn the lights back on. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. And what happened over there was I ended up getting a client that didn't speak Spanish. <laughs> she spoke a Mayan dialect from Guatemala called Canjobal. In Canjobal, uh, you know, it's a very, very unique dialect. Uh, and uh, I, had, I had the honor and the pleasure of representing her. And it was really difficult to communicate with her, but we were able to do it, and I understood her story, which was really powerful. You know, she ended up, uh, and I still feel it, because it's a very powerful story. Um, she ended up uh, uh, going through a lot of domestic violence. She had her rapist's child and was beaten, as well as her daughter, by her own father, her daughter's uh, grandfather. And she was fleeing this persecution. To me, it was one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult case that I had ever worked on. And I realized that uh, I just needed to do my best and I did, but I represented her on my last day of the volunteer program, and then I left, right? Because the, the volunteer program is one week, and then you leave, and you don't know necessarily what happens. 
It took, me, it took me several weeks to finally contact the program and figure out what had happened to her because, you know, what if she got deported? What if her asylum officer didn't believe her story and said, no, we don't believe you. We're not going to grant you your asylum request. We're going to go ahead and, and send you back to Guatemala to everything that you had experienced. And I was really scared. I was really scared. Uh, but I emailed the program director and I told the program director, hey, listen, can you let me know what the status is? And I was driving over here like on the 580 when I got the email. My wife was driving actually and I was checking my emails and I opened the email and I see the response from the director and I just started sobbing because she had been released and admitted to the United States. And so she's, she's here now in the US, safe with her two-year-old daughter. The message that I want you to keep in mind is for her, when she went to her city, where she's living now, the most beautiful gift that she received from us representing her was being able to walk on the street without being persecuted just being able to walk on the street with her daughter without thinking, am I going to die today, right? And for me, something shifted within me after that experience at Delhi, after representing her and, and, and dozens of other mothers and children who experienced very similar things. And what that was was a further alignment between my heart and my mind. Whereas before, I was an attorney that didn't really tap into the power of my heart. Now, that alignment was happening on a deeper and deeper level because I was able to experience through the eyes of, an, of another person situations that many folks out there will never hear about, will never know about, will be blind to, right? Don't focus on the wrong things. Don't focus on the wrong things. A lot of times we tend to do that. And don't let a day pass without being grateful for everything that you have in your life. I don't know when the last time was that you heard this, but I know as a first generation, I had to work through a lot of feelings of being a phony, of not being enough of feeling like a fraud. I'm gonna be discovered someday for the fraud and phony that I am, right? Those feelings are real and they happen very extensively. But what I want you to, what I want you to know is that those feelings are also emotions and you can work through them so that you can work within here through a lens of a more self-empowered you. You know why? Because you deserve that. As much as you might cringe inside right now when I tell you that you deserve that, you deserve that. I believe it, but it doesn't matter what I believe. It only matters what you believe. All right? So hold on to that. And I really hope that moving forward, you make, even if it's a small shift that comes out of this conversation that we're having, to move to a place of greater belief in yourself. Because you're going to need it. Everything that you're telling me that you want to do, you know, it's going to take a lot of courage, right? But I have to tell you, remember all those times that I told you that we faced some fear along the way? The one thing that you're going to have that we have to tap into is courage. And you're just gonna have to tap into that courage every single time. When I failed the bar, that, that was a lot of fear. Because so I was like, oh man, am I not worthy of this? Am I not worthy of receiving this awesome goal so that I can go out there and represent my community? And then I had to like quiet that mindset and be like, no, I got this. I'm gonna get back in the ring and I'm gonna study us just as hard, if not harder, and make it happen. So now it's your turn. Make it happen. You can do it. I believe in you. I'm really proud of you. 
you have to make sure that you're just really proud of yourself too. All right? So with that, I want to thank you for having me. And if there's any time for questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I got like five minutes. Five minutes? All right. So if anybody has questions or even comments, but questions. Um, I know on our class, I ask folks to bring questions for you. Yeah. I saw your hand go first, second, and then third. Okay. But yeah. it's a comment yeah. that even though I wasn't here throughout your whole talk, yeah. um, your message that just really spoke to me. And like, yeah. so, awesome. I appreciate that. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so you were second, third, and then we'll go back over here. Um, this makes me just a question. What's the difference between an attorney and a lawyer? So um, the way that I describe it, lawyer, you went to law school, but haven't gotten your license. So I was a lawyer for a period before I got my license, because I hadn't passed the bar yet. Once you pass the bar exam and you get your license, which I carry with me every day, wherever I go, where is it? No, I'm just kidding, it's over here. Uh, um, because it just took so much, so much effort, you know what I mean? Um, and that's what allows me to practice law in California, and that's when you become an attorney. So, that's a great question, by the way. It's not a... The attorney is like the truth law <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's when you're able to go into court and oh. represent a client. If you're, you're a lawyer, uh, in very limited situations, may you be able to go into court, but you can't you know, put your name as you know, attorney of record just yet. Sure. Being first generation um, versus being a straight immigrant, you know, being, you know, you know, if you were to come here to the United States at five and not having any, you know, type of certificate to allow you to stay here, was there any struggles that you didn't have to deal with that an immigrant would have to deal with? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of struggles actually you know, uh, that I didn't have to deal with having been born here in the United States. I think the main ones is being able to get a job when I was in high school. You know, being able to get a driver's license. You know, back in the day, immigrants couldn't do that. Now you, you can get a driver's, you can get a license and driver's license here in California, but back then those laws weren't in place. Getting loans to go to school. It's just, you know, a lot more challenges that I'm very grateful for that I didn't have to experience. But it's also kind of arbitrary just by the fact that, you know, I was born here, you know. Um, but that's the reason, too, why I decide to be very conscious about how I use my own power as an attorney, who I decide to help, you know, and who I decide to work with and who I decide to support, especially dreamers. They need our support, you know. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Cool. And then three and then four over here and then anybody else? So, um, I don't really know how to word my question yet, yeah. but I'm going to just give a little background information on it. Uh, so I am an I'm generally like a really positive person yeah. um, and I also practice meditation. But in, over the summer I took um, English 5, which had a lot to do with argumentative essays. Mm -hmm. And so we had one group project where we had to discuss ICE. Mm. And for the most part, I thought that a lot of people in the classroom were pretty progressive. Mm -hmm. But I came across two people who were also in my group who were very heavy Trump supporters. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when I told them the story of an, emotion, an, emo an emotional story that really hit home to me, yeah. which was I had gotten off the bar in the fruit vale and at La Clinica there was a raid going on. Mm. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, this is a space that like the most vulnerable of people are going into for whatever reason yeah. and that's the part like that's the place that they're targeting it's it's beyond me yeah and i told them that like like that is just un unjustifiable like if you know the, the whole thing is just so messy but then the response that i got from my classmate was well that was tactical right that was mm. that was good because it made sense yeah. and I just remember leaving like that class and like I spoke about it with my partner and I was just shattered shattered because like you know you're talking about emotions and, and being in tune with that and yet 
there are people who still, I mean, in every right, they have every right to think differently than you. But it's, it's like the, it's this feeling of like, you know that it's immoral and you know that it, there's no human decency when it comes to like this administration, really. So how do you, how do you talk to someone who has that kind of view and still keep your wellness intact? Because yeah. mine was kind of, it was like, oh, it was like a slap to the face of like reality and like, not everyone's gonna think like you, right? So, yeah. you know, how do you navigate? Well, that's a powerful question. It's a really good question. And it really gets to a lot of uh, uh, emotional awareness, one, and emotional processing, two, of those particular difficult conversations. Uh, and I think uh, for me, just on a personal level, because I can't speak for anybody else or anybody else's experience, but for me, it's really been about learning how to remain grounded and centered. Okay? Grounded in the sense of I know where I'm stepping, and I know that where I'm walking is aligned with my values and who I am. Does that make sense? That's the first part. Centered is being able to go to a place that recenters you. And it could be a place, you know, with your family, with your friends, with your loved ones. What is that place that recenters you? It could be music, it could be art, right? It could be working with kids. Right? It could be a lot of different things, but what centers you? So it's two different things, right? Being grounded and being centered. And it's something that you have to learn how to develop because it's not going to get any easier, right? In some ways, uh, the anti-immigrant sentiments now, it's definitely more challenging, challenging because it's just you know, out in the open. But in other ways, what that's doing, it's allowing people to take a hard look at what they're really capable in light of that pressure, right? I think there's like the saying like, you know, coal, like after a lot of pressure, it turns into a diamond, right? And so right now, people who are very vulnerable, people who are low income, people who look different, are definitely being uh, put under a lot of pressure. But we're also seeing a lot of you know, beautiful things coming from that. What you have to decide from your end, right, is, okay, and analyze. Why is it that that brought up so much for you? One, and then two, Learn how to harness it, because I'm sure you felt anger, but what you have to remember is there's 10 different types of anger. A lot of people don't know that. And there's anger where you're like driving, somebody cuts you off and then you're like really angry. That's different than righteous anger. Righteous anger is more along the lines of what you were feeling, where it's like, you know, that seems unjust, that seems unfair. It's what I was feeling when I was a kid, but didn't know what to do. Right, which is kind of similar to what you're feeling. And this, and, you know, I understand there's a you know, first, first Amendment right to free speech, but that just doesn't feel right. That doesn't sound right. Going after the most vulnerable communities in such a vulnerable space, in such an inhumane way, right? And so how are you gonna foster that energy for good? And it could be for the good of others, or you know, for the good of yourself. But here's what I have just, I went back to Dili again and I just came back last week from there, my second time, because I just, I needed to go back and help again. And I'm probably gonna do it again. I don't know yet when, but in helping others find their way, you find yours. So don't forget that. Figure out how are you gonna help others find their way. All right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I'm wondering, since you're in the field of law. Since I'm a what? Since you are in the field of law, yeah. which I have mad respect for, because I can never too, too much boring reading. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to someone who's in the field of law, and they have a different view than you, and they want to be in the field of law, and they want to 
overwhelmed. Yeah. I want to say this morning, like I said, I took time to watch the opening statement mm -hmm. of um, the professor. Or, uh, yeah. And just, you know, I listened to her whole statement because I wanted to hear her version of what happened. I wanted to really hear it out. And I was so glad I did, you know, because I got to meet her and get a sense of who she was. Yeah. And, um, you know, going out the door to come to school, I, I was struggling with, you know, wow, I don't know what's going to happen here, but I'm really glad I heard her speak her truth. Because I felt kind of a little bit of hope and yeah. kind of inspired by her. So people's truths inspire me. Yeah. So I wonder, you know, for you, since law is so complex, yeah. and, and uh, dry sometimes. Yeah, and dry. Dina's too, you yeah. know, um, you presenting two, two versions of the truth. I know. How do you, so how do you keep your spirit alive with that? First, I try to advocate on the right side of things. <laughs> you know, represent vulnerable communities. Uh, and I've always had this natural affinity for representing the underdog because I've been the underdog for many years in my own life. You know what I mean? And so I've had that just natural affinity. So uh, when it comes to to watching stuff. I don't watch too many lawyer shows because I kind of lived that already. So <laughs> um, I, I, I really, uh, for me, part of what I do outside that helps me stay sane and well is I, I'm a runner. Alicia knows that. We've run half marathons together before. And so I, I really like exercising. It's, it's one of my, uh, uh, my activities that helps nourish my physical well-being, but also my spirit. You know, um, and so I really like doing that. Uh, reading, I, I like personal and professional development books. So if you haven't read The Miracle Morning, I highly recommend it. It'll just really give you a different perspective as to how you can develop a morning routine that will work for you. That's where I got a lot of, you know, my ideas, my own ideas about your morning routine, right? So Miracle Morning is, is one. The Power of Now, too, by Eckhart Tolle is just really, really good. And uh, just an example of the kind of things that I like to read. Untethered Soul, uh, Whatever Arises, love that. And that's a really cool book because sometimes you'll judge yourself. And sometimes you'll get angry at yourself for judging yourself. <laughs> okay? But what that gets into is like, look, sometimes you judge yourself. It's okay. It's all right. You know, you're human. Sometimes you might do things that are not necessarily perfect and you might feel guilt. Look, you know, guilt's an emotion. Feeling guilty is not necessarily bad. It's actually, if you know how to use it, what it's doing, it's helping you come back to your values, right? So if these are your values and you start, you know, straying away, what guilt does is like, hey, 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 red alert, red alert, come back, come back, you know? And that's when you decide to come back, right? A lot of times we feel like, oh, we shouldn't feel this emotion because I'm supposed to be happy all the time, right? According to social media, I'm supposed to be feeling all this all the time. It's like, look, me, I know how to foster joy and excitement in my own life, but it doesn't mean I don't feel angry or sad or upset when different situations come up, you know, that I hear uh, an opposing argument that I completely disagree with, right? And so I think the message in that book is really powerful that whatever comes up for yourself, Learn to love that, right? And things that really get my mind uh, flowing in that regard, I, I feel are really important for me intellectually and professionally, right? And so one thing that you made me think of right now is don't, don't forget, in terms of success, you can all have everything that you desired to achieve for yourself, all the goals, you can have it all. And then also in terms of self-love, you can just keep that going, like the text messages, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you can just keep that going, okay? It's, it's, it's infinite. It's just infinite, the amount of success that you can have. There's no, just because Alicia is so successful doesn't mean that I, I can't have anymore because she's taking, no, no, no. There's none of that. Learn to move from a place of lack which I had to do over the years. I grew up lacking a lot of things, right? Growing up low income, there were just things that I didn't have to a place of abundance every day, all day, all the time. In this moment, 
right now, like here with us, like I'm nowhere else but here. And if you were to tell me, as we sit here, I right, stand here, you sit here talking, like right now, what problem do you have? What problem do you have? Not for tomorrow, not for later, just right now as we sit here in this room. Um, I guess, you know, for me, it's a, it's a question of, I beat myself up a lot. Right. Because I'm a perfectionist who's hardly perfect. Yeah. Um, but let me stop you, you right there. Right, right, right. But right now, in this moment, are you beating yourself up or are you just here? No, I'm pretty much just here listening because I'm a little... Right? Yeah, and so in this mo moment, do you have any problems? Just holding the damn That's okay. Good. <laughs> good. That's good. I love that. You know what? That's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, so in this moment, you feel that, right? But you know what? That's a beautiful sign that she is present, that she's here now. And my point is that's something that we can change and it'll be fine. If you try to remain here, now, present, as much as possible, your number of problems, they're going to go way down and if not, entirely eliminated. Just remain here. All right? Cool. So that's, that's all the time I have for her. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah.